Uh, but you know, and yeah, and some things have changed over the years. Uh, but the reason why that a lot of TV networks or systems or stations or whatever are either taking notice of wrestling, starting to be more uh, disposed to listen to wrestling projects, or in Sinclair's case, uh, spending more money on the one they got, is because the WWE just got $2 billion in a TV deal. And that's getting everybody said suddenly wrestling is hot again. And I'm not talking about the in-ring and the business. And yes, things are coming up for the independence and et cetera. Although actually case could be made. Things went down for TNA and at the same time they went up for ring of honor. So it, it flip flopped real quick. But even just a few years ago, when TNA went from spike to, to destination America, to fucking pop to what it, I don't even know. Is it still pop now? What's going on with TNA impact? I have what are no they idea. On? I have no idea. Okay, well, they, the point is, the, and they were the number two. They couldn't, and and they can't. They couldn't find any outlets. But now suddenly, more people in television as a whole are starting to look at wrestling because Vince got two billion dollars. And now, just like in 1984, for those of us who lived through that, the people in the media. Uh, and people who make these decisions suddenly think wrestling is hotter than it's been in years when it's already been hot for a while. But it's it's that type of decisions amongst the TV networks and the uh, uh, the media platforms and people that can put money into things. That's what determines whether wrestling gets hot these days or not. In in you know in in pretty much all cases and. So now it's an interesting time where things can happen. Ring of Honor, <clears throat> um, in in 2009, Sinclair Broadcasting had no idea that they would ever give a shit about wrestling. Joe Coff had entertained thoughts at some point about doing something again, like he'd done in Florida in the 80s. Uh, but it, it wasn't hot at that point. But what had happened when, when uh, once again, I got fired from TNA and it made the uh, the news – Kerry had called me, and this was about 10 days before that New York show, and he told me that they had the HD net program, but that it had made no difference in terms of their their revenue. And I says, because honestly, at that time, HD net, now Access TV, it was so hard to get then. It was on a premium. I had to pay 10 bucks a month just to get it here in Louisville to watch the show that I was a part of when I joined Ring of Honor. Um, Not a lot of people were seeing it, and it wasn't – It wasn't a platform you could make new fans off of. The fans that you had were going out of their way to get the the program. It was a cart before the horse. Um, And he had told me that that they just needed to either cut their expenses, increase their revenue, or both, or get somebody to put them on a platform where they could make some money. And they were in Dayton, Ohio. Just a couple of days later, I said, well, let me come up to Dayton. I didn't go to the house show. I met. Uh, Adam Pierce, who was booking for Carrie at the time, and Carrie at uh, a, a Denny's or something after the show uh, in Dayton. I just went up there just to talk to him. I didn't want the fans to know I was around. And, you know, once again, the, the Ring of Honor had come into existence in a kind of a, a backwards way from most wrestling promotions because it started as a promotion that just wanted to put on shows and videotape them and sell the videotapes and the, DV- or the DVDs then were the primary source of income. But it had gotten past that, but they hadn't changed the model. And the DVD sales had, had declined. What what year did that start happening with everything? But when the internet started going up, 2007, 8-ish. Yeah, I mean, it was around this time that Ring of Honor was definitely starting to feel the crunch. Yeah, because they were putting out a more professional project product um, and and had bigger names, but they weren't selling as many DVDs because nobody was buying DVD. They were bootlegging shit, and they were getting it on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. But they did have the the inkling of the internet pay per view at that time. They hadn't done one yet. They were about to, but there were. I, I saw that they had to change some of the things they they did, the ways that they made money, but also they had come into the business backwards as far as a promotion. When you, I I told Kerry that I would help him somehow that I would either get him on TV or make him some money or, or whatever, and cut him some costs in the meantime to, because he believed in the thing. And, and, and so did I, cause they, they had a lot of talented guys and they had a, a loyal, but small audience. Um, so w- when I debuted in New York city, 
I that was just to kind of let people know that I was there, but I didn't want to be a huge, uh, you know, on camera presence at ringside or on the on the the roster or whatever. But I I wanted to be, which is the same function I served for a couple of years was in OVW as well. The guy that could kind of convey the rah rah message to the fans, right? <laughs> Get behind us, we're doing some serious shit which is what I did. And people loved it for two years until Sinclair bought it. And then they wouldn't let me go out and defend shit anymore. And then I rapidly lost, Oh, I had a promo on go fight live that would have got us back in the internet pay-per-view business, but they wouldn't let me anyway. <clears throat> so the point is I started then going to the house shows and Carrie's deal with me. I'll be honest at the time was that because he had a budget from HD net for the television sh- tapings, he could pay me to come to them and help produce the shows and help produce the announcers or do whatever else I could do. Uh, but, you know, he was already losing money on the house shows. I went to the house shows for a while, everything within reason, for nothing. I'd set up the merchandise table or whatever to make my trance. But I had to see the guys work and the matches and how the people were taking them, etc. Because I had to research the product to know how to sell it. And then I started uh, – <laughs> Kerry was able to share with me some of the facts and figures because at one point, it, I remember an early WrestleMania weekend show. He was, we were in Phoenix. It was like 2010 or whatever. He said, my God, how many people did I fly to Phoenix, Arizona? Because that's not close to anything in fucking Phoenix, right? And they, he bought like 40-something plane tickets. And he said, what is this, make a wish? And so – they had been running Ring of Honor like all the roster was a family, and you hear that a lot, in, especially in indie wrestling. We're all a family. Well, at the, at the level where you're not making any money but you're not spending a lot of money, you can all be a family. But at the level where there's one guy that's spending a lot of fucking money, you need to be a team, not a family. You're a sports franchise. You're the Dallas Cowboys, and you all need to be on the same team, and, and the roster needs to stick together and work for a common goal. But if you're, frankly, not pulling your weight or – Subject to budget cuts, that happens in a business. So you're a sports team. You're not a family. And I sat down and looked, and I said, and this was where the problem came with some guys like Joey Ryan in uh, Austin Aries a little bit later on. Joey Ryan and a few others were immediate. I said, you, you're, and I know the guy was over in California, but the way he was being used at the time, he wasn't throwing people around with his dick. He was being used as a kind of a middle card guy that lost more than he won on HDNet and was an average worker, in my opinion. And I said, you mean tell me you're paying this guy three or $400 a night for two nights in a row plus a plane ticket from California to do something in the middle of a roster of 40 other guys that somebody from Philly that could drive and do it for 100 bucks could do? And we made a list of people who, as I termed it, Will the fans set the seats on fire if they are not on this show? And we saved him about three or four thousand dollars in total costs with transportation and payoffs and et cetera from just taking six or seven guys off the house shows. That was the kind of thing that that we need to do first. And I got some heat with some guys, but I'm sorry. It's not that I hated you for life and in Colt Cabana's case, because he did funny shit and that wasn't what I was about to try to sell. But can't afford to pay everybody. It's not make a wish, right? Um, and trying to get some of the expenses under control because there wasn't a lot of other expenses. This was still a nice wrestling shoestring operation, but there was there was expenses that could have been alleviated, and and hopefully they were. But then also I started calling people. You know this. You're well aware of this. I tried to plumb some contacts out of you for pay per view or television or just some of the people that you had done business with, uh, sometimes with varying degrees of success, depending on the cooperation we got from the other side. I know I've already said that for you. Anyway, um, but I tried to start calling everybody I knew that had promoted or that worked with arenas or that had contacts with any kind of sponsors or anybody that might be able to help. And and also try to make some deals with some guys that I that would come in for a seduced rate for me uh, to try to help a, a young company. And you know, whether, whether we brought Terry Funk to New York or, you know, got Haas and Benjamin involved. Um, it was to bring name value with guys that were still well thought of and weren't going to, it wasn't going to be the fucking Hulk Hogan and friends hour. It's going to be guys that were valuable in the business. 
And sooner or later, we thought something would hit. We needed a real TV program. We needed to be in real arenas instead of rec centers. And mostly, uh, most importantly, we needed, a, until we could get those things, uh, definitely a, a better website and the Internet pay-per-view situation to build because I, I had a lot of faith in that from, from the word go. So that's that's what we were trying to do at, at the start of things. And, you know, it took a while, but then we started getting a little feedback. And, uh, and then, of course, Gary Jester, who I originally – thought he has contacts at a lot of arenas from his days with WCW. And it, yes, we can't run a 10,000 seat building in Chicago, but is there a mid-sized building or just a, a sponsorship opportunities or just some knowledge on promoting live events? And he knew Joe Coff. And so that's when I wrote a proposal for what we termed a strategic partnership between Ring of Honor and Sinclair Broadcast, basically trying to get a Ring of Honor television program on their air because they own 75 television stations. And that kind of exposure would be leaps and bounds above what Ring of Honor had at that point and could make them competitive. Um, Had you ever heard of Sinclair Broadcasting before this? Truthfully, no. Truthfully, no. I had not paid a little because I hadn't been trying to syndicate a television show in 15 years at that point since Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And I hadn't kept up. I obviously knew many of the stations that they owned because I I had done wrestling programs on several of them and, and Crockett had been on a number of them and et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't know that they were the largest independent uh, owner of, of local television stations in the country. They had like 70 of them at that point in time. So when I found that out, yeah, there you go. Because see, it was very important. This was part of the pitch that it had been – A staple of broadcast television since the dawn of broadcast television, professional wrestling. And for the first time in 60 years, the WWF was all cable. TNA was all cable. There was no wrestling promotions, uh, save a few little local outfits on their local stations. There was no broadcast wrestling or wrestling on broadcast television. So this was one way to get them kind of intrigued with it. And then to explain the difference, I have the proposal here in my hand, which was nine and a half pages, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I kind of gave him a, a lay of the land of, of what the landscape of wrestling was today. And also this was information that Joe knew, but that also that he could convey to his superior officers. It's kind of written down in a, in a form that not wrestling fan, but a television executive might understand. Uh, dealing with the, the WWE's boom and then their complacency at that point and that TNA was faltering even at that point and that Ring of Honor the third wrestling promotion I didn't bother to say how far down but they were the third wrestling promotion was the only product that was gaining ground and gaining momentum and the mostly male 16 to 35 and 18 to 34 and 18 to 45 uh, year old demographic that they love to advertise to on local television stations. And also a key part of it was when you're trying to sell wrestling to television executives, whether it's local, regional, or national, they are not wrestling fans. If they are, you're, 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 you're great. You're gold, but they're not wrestling fans. And they're not going to understand if you say that, well, Dave Meltzer of this wrestling newsletter, or whatever says that we are the greatest product. They want to have some frame of reference, as Jim Ross would say, something to hang their hat on. What was hot in 2010, 2011? Not pro wrestling, the UFC. Not even MMA, because UFC, it's like Coca-Cola for soft drink and WWE for wrestling. UFC was what they knew of MMA, and that was hot, and they were doing big pay-per-view numbers, and they were getting TV ratings. And I said, Ring of Honor, the young athletes in this wrestling league train in MMA and 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 have a UFC based approach because we had Edwards and Richards and O'Reilly and those guys but it was something for the TV people to understand well hey this is a hot thing this might be interesting it's different than that stuff that we you know maybe we've seen and don't much like on you know the cable networks uh it, it was something to make it look younger and hipper and we had guys that could carry that off because I've always said the great wrestling promoters and territories always presented a style that they were comfortable with 
and that they knew would get over in their area. Well, our area at this point really was trying to get on television. 